Welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative producer is Nancy Cole, and this program looks at art and culture around the Tampa Bay area from varying perspectives. And it's May, and it's graduation month. Everybody's graduating from here in May, particularly thousands of USF students. But I've got one particular USF student who is graduating who responded to a challenge in her life while she was in the MFA program at the University of South Florida College of the Arts with such spirit and talent that I thought it's a story we've got to hear about. Her name is Megan Hildebrandt, and she's my <laughs> guest, and welcome. Thank you. I didn't realize that the MFA program itself was three years. Yeah. And wow. th three years is starting to become more the norm for mm -hmm. university programs just because it gives you an extra year in the studio and yeah. it's great. It, does it allow you to say expand to computer art? Oh yeah something? and it's interdisciplinary so ev it's just called studio art so I uh -huh. came in as a performance artist uh -huh. and then I ended up going to animation and now drawing and painting. Ah, That's very yeah. interesting so you have that kind of Room to stretch. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of yeah. breath. You can meet with anyone from any department. Well, before we get to the, to the, the heart of the story, yeah. let's start at the beginning because sure. you, d you didn't come from Florida. No. You came from Detroit. Detroit. <laughs> yeah, I grew up. North of Detroit. Everybody I like says to say I Detroit, come from Detroit, and it makes me sound <laughs> tougher than I really am. <laughs> well, I grew up in a suburb of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, called Wald Lake, Michigan, Oakland County. Uh -huh. um, and my dad is an architect, and my mom has her background in youth ministry uh -huh. and social work and history. Right. So I came from two very different people. and But they would always do a lot of craft projects with me. My mom was obsessed with she and I like building things out of popsicle sticks. I think she felt like she wasn't the architect, so she was going to try or something. <laughs> and my dad would always just, for any holiday, he, he gave me the responsibility of making all the decorations for every holiday. Oh, wow. It was kind of like a sweatshop. Okay. Were you allowed to keep it from year to year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got the Christmas one from last year, Dad. Uh -huh. But it didn't stop you from cheerleading? No, and yeah. Doing field and track and doing all that stuff until... Yeah, I tripped. I, yeah, I tripped. Well, I was really um, doing. I was doing. Yeah, gymnastics, cheerleading, and hurdles in track, wow. and that can strain and do weird things to your entire body in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I got like dropped as a cheerleader often, like on my head because I was the flyer. I also think I got. Yeah, the the big thing was like a hip injury on my tail leg oh. um, from hurdles. So. Uh -huh. I then kind of went into doing like acting and theater, musicals, but the big thing I just got really focused on was my art. Uh -huh. um, and so I did, I just became this like art kid. I like pierced my nose, I dyed my hair and cut it really short. I was like a totally identity transformation from cheerleader to punk art kid. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> and it sounds even better that the school was didn't throw up his hands and what's she doing? Oh no! Hey, let her expand a yeah, little. She's yeah, yeah. Trying this out. And it was before a lot of standardized testing uh, in Michigan, so we didn't have to worry as much about that. Well, and you had art, and right? I mean, what, art, music—it's going away. From yes. So many. And things. I had a diff very different experience because this was like in the yeah. you know late '90s, early 2000s. Sure. So, what made you go to the University of Michigan? Um, I want well. Hmm. They offered really good financial aid, which is also why I ended up at USF. Mm -hmm. um, I had a dream of going to like the big art schools, like I wanted to go to RISD or Pratt or School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh -huh. But when it came down to it, I think my parents had sort of like spent a lot of money on traveling to all these places with me. And then I did get accepted to some of them, but they were like, um, honey, you got to go inside of Michigan because now we can't really afford anything else. But it was good. We got to travel. So also, <laughs> though, it, University of Michigan was very concept-driven and interdisciplinary in the same way as USF is, ah. um, the program I'm just coming out of. So I think I've always been attracted to programs that don't force you to focus on one thing, but allow you to kind of like explore every different media. And find new applications yeah. to work with new materials and so mm -hmm. forth. So it's that kind of feeling of mastering yeah. everything there is, learning everything there yeah, is. Yeah, and then learn. choosing what you feel at the right. end. 
Mm -hmm. right, right. You can't you can't know that you'll be comfortable in this and feel inspired yeah. if you have not been able to try yeah, it. Yeah, like we were, we had to learn wood shop, which was terrifying for me. I like was so scared of the saws and you know, the teacher's like this macho, like, <laughs> I know you girls might feel uncomfortable in this room. So. <laughs> and everybody ran out. Yeah. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, we are uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't. Thank but, you. But after you graduated, uh, you didn't go immediately in MFA. Uh, you you did a lot of activity yeah. at various cultural centers, and they're geographically spread. And take yeah. us through that. Well, I first moved to Baltimore because I um, was going to be a live-in nanny with a family I had babysat for in Ann Arbor. Um, and it was a great situation coming out of undergrad. She's like, you know what? She had just gotten divorced from her husband. She's like, you can come live with me rent-free, watch my kids two days a week after school, and she just like loved that I was an artist. We really got along. She's like, I just want you to do art projects with my kids and like you're free every other day of the week. I was like, okay. That is unusual. Yeah, and I didn't need, even though Baltimore's public transit leaves something to be desired, it's a lot better than Tampa. So I moved there, I didn't need a car. I was just yeah. taking the bus every day. Like, and I ended up working for the Walters Art Museum there. Um, but then I got, um, a residency. I got four residencies while I was in Baltimore that kind of took me in and out of there, although it was my home base. So the first one was called Art Train USA, and it's based out of Ann Arbor, and their NEA funding was great then. Now it doesn't exist anymore That's because right. of it being pulled. But um, I basically lived on the caboose of a train with two sort of grumpy old men train engineers and four artists. And the train was all curated by the Smithsonian. Oh, you mean you really lived I on the train? I lived on the caboose. Okay. So, and Not the, with the two kids. No. no. <laughs> you have to leave every two days. I, I did. I was like, sorry, I'll come back. Okay. Um, but we, the whole train took this Smithsonian collection to a lot of small, impoverished towns that had no arts access. And we, as the residents, served as like the docents that would take them through the five um, Porter Pullman cars, and then at that back was our studio, so we could just work on whatever we wanted and kind of show them that. Um, so I traveled, I lived on this thing for six months, going from up uh, Detroit, Ann Arbor, and then we rode all the way down to like the deep south. I think we ended up in um, Louisiana and New Orleans. That's very interesting. Yeah. In, in its own way, it, it sounds like it had for some people, it might have, and I hope it did, uh, the same effect that the WPA project, yes. art project, yeah. had. I mean, people who never thought of art yeah. would suddenly see a mural and look at it and say, I could do that. And that was the most exciting part of it. And it really, like, and even in my work now, like, it made me have this passion for non-artists to look at work with me, look at my work, like, because the whole show that was curated on it was contemporary Native American artists. Uh. And especially, like, in the South, where mm -hmm. there's still, like, so much tension, like, for them to look at Indian art and not think of it as, you know, squanto, or, like, these, these t stereotypes and see that Native American artists yeah. are working now, they're not a thing of the past, and that they are making extremely, like, valid art that you can connect to and it's not just a painting of like Pocahontas. You That's know what right. I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so for there, from there I moved back to Baltimore to live in an old um, 1930s movie house that had been converted into a gallery, two galleries, um, seven like 1200 square foot live work studios and classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so I lived there for two years. Um, which was great because I worked there too. So my whole existence in Baltimore was like in one building in this kind of rough neighborhood of East Baltimore. Um, we're talking about the wire. I we are you know the wire is <laughs> yeah. it's in some ways shows only the dark side of Baltimore but sure. in a lot of ways it's not that far from the truth. My neighborhood was um, more like there's a lot of like um, like immigrants from like Central America, South America. Um, but there was also, you know, a lot of Polish, white, Baltimorean, I'm not gonna say Baltimoreans, because that's what they <laughs> that's what they call themselves, but I'm not doing it. Baltimoreans who lived around here and had never gone four blocks out of this square neighborhood. And so, um. I mean, again, with the tension, like, you know, and then there was like 
a big African American population. And what I liked about Baltimore, unlike Detroit, was that white flight happened in Detroit and everyone just went north of Eight Mile. And so there was there still is a very much a line in Detroit. Mm -hmm. But in Baltimore, even though there were these sections, there was more like crisscross and there was like you could get into all these different kinds of neighbors within a four, four block radius. The way it's supposed to be. The, it's supposed to be. And so the wire is true in some ways, but there is more interaction and not danger. <laughs> well, I bet that's what makes uh, art such a, a, a gift to kids. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah. Now, where else did you go? I also did a residency for one month in the woods alone, which I'm oh, pretty wait social. A I know. paid you to live by yourself. I know. <laughs> well, I know. Well, it was like I, it was in a, a state park called Fort Warden State Park up in Port Townsend, Washington, which is like the very tip of Washington. I mean, you can like see Canada and like a little bit of Alaska, right? And it's like, you are <laughs> up there. And it was right on the Puget Sound. Oh wow! And so, and I had this little cottage and I'm alone because there's one artist and like the writer's cabin was like on the other side and they were kind of a hermit. So I was like, okay, it's like me and the park ranger for a month. My work, <laughs> it was, but I just kind of like went on a lot of walks. You could hear like wolves howling. It was uh, such a change from Baltimore. Oh, I bet. So well, I, when you were in the kitchen, uh, this was before Sarah Palin, yeah. did you think you could see her? <laughs> I, I was just going to say, you know, she's, she's wrong. She's, she, she's wrong. She's exaggerating. She's exaggerating. Okay. Um, so I, I went there, and directly from there, I went to, to a month in Johnson, Vermont, at Vermont Studio Center, mm -hmm. which was like the polar opposite of an experience, because I went from alone in a cabin and then at Vermont Studio Center, there were 60 artists from all over the world, a lot of them from China, um, and, and just a lot from our country. And so that was like a great kind of relief and kind of, um, I was able to make very different work at that residency yeah. because I had a lot more critical input. And you saw other people's style, yes. reactions to various exactly. things. Exactly, and you're you doing may have. studio visits with yeah. them. Well, that's sort of like writing uh, retreats. Yes. When you get fellowships to them and so forth. So that really was it. Vermont Studio Center has writers at it. And so they would give readings yeah. and then we would give slide talks. It was a really nice. A nice thing. Yeah. Well, there is a, a writer, uh, rather an artist here, a watercolor artist, who um, probably annually goes and gets a uh, fellowship yeah. to a place in South Carolina okay. to live by herself and paint what she sees. Yeah. And it, it's really a sort of uh, an internal time. I yes. think she describes it as that. Well, yeah, I mean, and you need, I think especially if you have to think about making a living the rest of the year. Residencies sure. for me have been a great thing for my career because I don't know where my next studio is going to be after grad school. And so just knowing that I have two residencies, I'm going to at least have a studio and a block of time, right. you know? Well, how did you choose USF? I got into several um, schools, so I did have a choice, but um, USF would, was the first one that got back to me. Um, I think every faculty member called me personally, which was like all the other schools were just like, yeah, you got in, we'll let you know about the money soon, you know? Um, and USF just seemed so warm, not desperate, it was just like, I felt like I was already part of their community because I had like talked to every single one of them already. Um, and I just really got along with Wally Wilson, the director. And they're just, I don't want to say they're buttering you up, but they're just great about being specific about what they like about your work and why they want you to come. Additionally, the financial package is That's amazing great. for grad students That's here. That's wonderful. Yeah. That is wonderful. And of course, he came from the University of Florida, where he was uh, chair of the art oh. department there. Yeah. Um, well, now we get to the drama. Oh, here. yeah. And now, <laughs> here you are, how many months into uh, your studies? I was basically no months into my no, studies. No. I got. Did you feel a little ill or off? I, well, I left Baltimore August 1st. Um, to drive from Baltimore in this really crappy Volvo that I was just praying would make the trip, right, um, down to Tampa. And I woke up the morning I was leaving, and I felt this little bump right here. Mm -hmm. Just, and I thought, like, I, didn't have, I haven't had health insurance since I was 21, so I, like anything else, I was like, it's going to go away. Yeah. By the time it, I got to Baltimore, I got to Tampa, the bump had, like, 
quadrupled in size and it was kind of like the size of a softball. Um, so I have this like thing on my neck and I had like very long blonde hair at the time. Just like August in Tampa, I'm like wearing scarves, you know, I'm like just putting all my hair to one side because I'm meeting all the new grad students I'm going to be <laughs> with for three years. Um, I was having night sweats a lot, but I also thought, well, I live in Florida now, you know, and so maybe that's why this is, I'm feeling like this. Every time I drank beer, it would like, th this lump thing would just throb mm. and it would just get really big. So I'm like, am I allergic to beer? Which is going to be like really bad. Your staple. Yeah, yeah, my staple. <laughs> um, well, well, how long did it take you before you thought, I better see somebody? Well, I, my, my new colleagues in the grad program were the ones that really like, were like, you have to start taking this seriously. Because I had gotten misdiagnosed at university emergency. They, they kind of, you know, and this is common with young adults, that you, mm -hmm. you have a lot of trouble getting diagnosed because they think the perception is young adults do not get cancer. You're too young for this. And I got that said to me. Um, by like a Doogie Howser looking doctor over at um, the university ER who was just saying, you know, I think you're depressed because I'm like, I'm like really worried about something. Right. So, and he's there's like, something on my I know head. there's something, they did a CT scan even. Yeah. And he said, you know, I think it's just an infection, take seven days of antibiotics and he sent me out the door. Hmm. And so I'm thinking, okay, a doctor tells you that, you trust it. So uh, it took me a long time time to get diagnosed. I mean, it ended up being, I think, sep end of September that I got the official diagnosis from Moffitt. But if you think about that, that's like a good two months of sensing something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And again, this happens to a lot of young adults. Yes. Um, so I ended up getting officially diagnosed at, at Moffitt um, September 30th and started chemo like that day. Wow. Yeah. Well, you certainly came to the right university. I did. Isn't it odd? I've I, thought I about think it's that. Quite fortuitous. Yes. Yeah. And um, and then you have then you have this prospect. Yeah. And of course, as your chemo goes on, it has certain physical effects too. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you decide to deal with it? Well, I. Um, they told me I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is like kind of a young adult cancer, um, or it's like someone over 60 could get it. Uh -huh. um, and so my outlook was very positive. That sounds weird to say that when you're diagnosed with cancer, they're like, it's gonna be okay. But you know, I never thought I was gonna like die because they were just telling me you have 80% survival rate. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're also saying, make sure you preserve your eggs before you start chemo tomorrow. <laughs> and you have to have $10,000 to even do that, right? And so it's like I'm living off of an $80 Target gift card <laughs> until my student loans come through, right? Like I can't go do that. So there's a lot of different curveballs they're throwing at you while you're still hooked up to stuff being told mm -hmm. you have cancer. Um, I didn't shave my head at first, which I think was a mistake now because the nurses who always want to make you feel better at Moffitt would keep saying, honey, you have such thick hair. We really think you might be one of those people that your hair doesn't all fall out. Uh, and it was taking a very long time, which made it more emotionally <laughs> horrible <laughs> because it's like every time I'm in the shower, I'm just pulling out like clumps of blonde hair. Mm -hmm. You know, you see it in the drain, you see it all over your car, you know, and it's just, and, but, but you couldn't really tell if I started chemo in September, in December, by December, I had like started to have like a bald patch, uh -huh. which I didn't see late, because yeah. no one told me right. until I was up in Detroit and my little sister was like, okay, you are embarrassing me. You have a bald spot. We're shaving your head. And so my little sister is the one. She wasn't who, that little. She was, she, yeah, she's like, she was 21, but you know, she, okay, right. <laughs> but she's the one that really who said it? Yeah, she was yeah, saying you have this. to do it. So yeah. I ended up shaving my head around New Year's Eve um, 2009, so New Year's Day 2010. Um, and for me, the total loss of my hair, it wasn't just like you shave your head and you look cute. It's like you shave your head and nothing is growing back. It's like clear you're sick. Um, that was really, really hard because I was like, I'm really sick now. Because before I was sick, but you couldn't tell. And I didn't choose to wear um, a hat or a wig. I just kind of wore these 
crappy hoodies from like American Apparel that I had had for like 10 years and I would just like slump around in it. Um, and I, I just, I didn't want to wear a hot wig in Florida and I didn't want to wear like a hot hat. I just walked around bald. Well, yeah. when, when did you decide I'm going to make this part of my art? Yeah. My art is going to be my response to this. Well, it wasn't immediate for sure. Actually, uh -huh. while I was going through chemo, which was ended up being about seven or eight months because I didn't finish September, beginning of April, my first year of grad school, and a lot of my professors at the time suggested this is very rich territory. <laughs> I mean, but at the same time, I was spending so much of my life at Moffitt in chemo. I wanted my art studio to be the place it, cancer could not get. However, towards the end of, that, of my chemo year, I started doing all this work about natural disasters around Tampa. Uh -huh. So I'm talking about sinkhole victims, giant portraits of sinkhole victims, like um, you know alligators, people being struck by lightning. And to me, that all like a sinkhole was cancer. Being struck by lightning was me getting cancer at 25. You know, so I mean, I was already exploring like death and horrific injury, right? And um, but I just wasn't calling it cancer art. I started to do it more directly after I had been put into remission, mm -hmm. um, which was 2011, early 2011. I think, you know, it, it, when, when I first heard you speak at uh, an art event, mm -hmm. um, I was immediately reminded of uh, an artist who was a well-established and 65 probably plus when he had, and he was from New York, he had taught in many New York and East Northeastern environs and he was doing very well and he had a, heart, a very major heart attack and uh, he came out with a, uh, his next show hmm. which was like a magical view of a house you could see right through the roof and there's a woman at the window she's a small house and she's sort of small and she's looking out the window mm. and there's something that looks like Gulliver from mm. Gulliver's Travel he has been felled and you can see part of this huge arm and shoulder and you can see his head turned mm. and he stretches out way beyond the house yeah but I looked and I thought that is really amazing because it tells you what he thought of himself yes. before and it tells you what he what happened to him so it did yeah. two things, and what you were doing were do, was doing essentially yeah. different but the same. Yes. The, respe the response, the instinct to make something of this. And I think like, I really identify with his work, right? Because when cancer, I mean, I'm thinking cancer, heart attacks on a broader scale, 9-11, like how do you make art that can live up to or at all reflect that kind of personal tragedy or that society, like how do you make a monument to 9-11? Like, like there's right. so many debates about things right. like that, like Maya Lin's Vietnam Wall. I mean, it's like yes. the art, it's so much pressure to live up to that in the work that right. you can make because you know the experience was huge. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, and you've named three of the best kinds of responses because they have touched people in varying ways. Yeah. People who, uh, soldiers who keep looking for their friends on yes. the wall. And, and children who never knew their father. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it, it, it has that response that Americans particularly, I think, draw strength from it. Yes. You know, we're, we're in this together kind of a feeling. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why the art is so really wonderful because it heals more than just one person, mm -hmm. you know. It talks to so many. Yeah. And that, that's terrific. Now, tell me, when I went into the museum yesterday mm -hmm. uh, and saw the first, was the chemo one, mm -hmm. it was static. I yeah. just knew it was static, you know, mm -hmm. all these little cross hatches, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking it must have been like, <laughs> like that, like let's get this over with. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, I bet. Um, and the others were were very much this continuation of the journey. Yeah. So um, I think the piece you're talking about is the counting radiation one, yeah. the big um, right thing that's on display right now at the Contemporary Art Museum. It um, well, it was a process going into that work because it's a lot more abstract than uh -huh. anything I've done before. Right. Um, it's just a, like basically 50 foot long drawing 
a kind of a landscape drawing made up of cross hatches. Um, just the five lines over and over again in, a lot, in several different media. And um, when I first started it, it's because my oncologist over at Moffitt, after a recent CT scan, said to me, I think we should stop giving you so many CT scans now. And I had been concerned about how many yeah. CT scans I had been getting along with chemo, along with like, all these different things that are put into your body and like giving you radiation, even though I never had radiation treatment itself. Uh -huh. um, because I had asked him, how much radiation am I being exposed to in every CT scan? And he said, well, Florida law has just kind of come up with this new uh, mandate that we are way more, we have to be way more conservative with the CT scans we sure, give. Sure. Um, which Europe has been doing for a long time, but America's way is like, kill the cancer, you know, get it. <laughs> right. um, and I said, well, how many? Like, what is, can you give me any number of the radiation? He said, well, for every CT scan of your head and neck we've given you, you've been exposed to one lifetime of radiation. Whoa. And then he said, so how many have we given you? And I'm like, you're my doctor, don't you know? <laughs> right. And he said, um, how many have we given you? And I was like, well, 16 over two years. And he's like, mm. okay, so that means you're about 1,300 years old. And it's like when your oncologist is telling you you're now 1,300 years old in radiation years, that's a big number. That's right. a big thing to deal with. <laughs> right. Like, what are you talking about? I know. <laughs> so I just went back to my studio and was like, how am I going to deal with this number? Like, it's huge. And I started breaking it down. Like, okay, 1,300. Like, how many months have I been exposed to it, right. how many weeks, minutes, seconds, and I started to get this giant number. Right. And I thought I was just going to count to that number. And Did I just, you give up in the middle? You're saying, it's a done deal. Well, I, I'm, I I'm, realized, on, I'm on. I realized <laughs> you know? I could never get there uh -huh. because, well, I, so there's, I think, nine panels on display at the museum, right. and there's actually total like 19 or 20 at this point. Um, and they're all like eight feet tall. 50 inches wide. You won. I won. You won. I won. That's wonderful. You know what? <laughs> and you succeeded. And oh, that's you. the wonderful part. <laughs> and and you're, you're now you're going out into the world and uh, fully armed, mm -hmm. <laughs> as it were. Yeah. And it and and 30 minutes have come and gone. <laughs> yeah. And this program is <laughs> just a great a great tribute to what art can do for you and what you can do for art because it's a two-way street. Everybody benefits, and you graduated. So <laughs> thank you. Keep up with us. We're, we're going to follow you. your career. Oh, thank you so and much. And everybody, if you have the opportunity to stop by the Contemporary Art Museum on the USF campus, it's one of the best graduate shows I've ever seen, and I hang around the campus a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I recommend it highly. Thank you thank so you. much. It's just a great story, and it's going to be a great future. I know it.